This presentation aims to help students understand and minimize bias. Please pause at any point and adjust the playback speed to your liking. Let's begin by thinking about why this topic is important. For the major issues in our world and our individual lives, bias is involved. It feeds our mindsets and shapes our interactions, whether we realize it or not. Bias influences both researchers and participants. Furthermore, when a reader perceives bias in research, it negatively impacts their view of the researcher and the study. Whether the bias is real or only perceived, beliefs on bias in academic research impact how academia is valued. For that reason alone, it's worthwhile for you to get things right. Bias impacts learning and life. Human survival used to depend on the belief systems and heuristics that were developed individually and collectively. Over time, these beliefs and thought processes became internalized, automated, behavior. These automatically biased behaviors then shaped how we treat people and information, as well as how others treat us. Unsurprising, some of these very traits necessary for human survival in the past have become causes for present problems. When it comes to biases in academia, here are some notable ones I'll discuss. As you can see, confirmation bias is a big one. In actuality, though, there are countless biases and many overlap. Covering everything is not possible. At the very least, my goal is to highlight some important ones and get you thinking about issues particular to your current or potential study. When it comes to minimizing bias, Bias is simply not something we can eliminate. When you're searching for literature, though, you'll want to objectively follow the literature trail and understand how things have changed over time. You'll want to search for and synthesize what you need for your study as opposed to what you want to find. And you'll want to design your study with consideration of many potential biases. Confirmation bias can be defined as the search, interpretation, and recollection of information that confirms existing beliefs while also ignoring contradictory evidence. If you only remember one bias from this presentation, remember confirmation bias. And understand that confirmation bias is an automated behavior, instinctual and habitual. For you, confirmation bias will influence the treatment and consideration of all parts of your research for both you, your participants, and whomever reads your writing. This includes your chair and committee members. It's also common for humans to make excuses for their biases, and academic research is not an exception to that. Here are some common excuses. Skepticism basically amounts to claiming the full truth is not possible to know. Hence, knowledge is perspective-based, and every perspective is worth sharing. The you're entitled to your truth and I'm entitled to mine is an argument often used. It's also a common ploy for pushing pseudoscience as well as counter arguments to widely accepted scientific beliefs. Essentially, it's an excuse for confirmation bias. It's basically the behavior of, I don't believe in what you're telling me, so I'm going to find evidence that supports what I believe. Consequentialism weighs the use of bias, ethics, and conflicts of interest based on the expected and eventual outcome. Its argument basically relates to others are doing it and my intent is good, so what I'm doing is okay. Ultimately, though, the argument for the benefits of research outweighing the potential harm is not something a researcher should be deciding for themselves, based most obviously on their own biases. There is also the excuse of denial. A researcher might rationalize that bias will have little influence over their study or that it's a case study which permits bias, neither of which are true. This might lead to a researcher studying their own business, employees, co-workers, and the like because they deny the importance and or influence of bias. And the last excuse I'll discuss is the I didn't mean to or the I didn't know excuse of unconscious bias. Remember, you're doing doctoral level research. Unconscious bias errors should be very minimal. Academic behavior is learned and you should be prepared to do the work and to check your bias. You don't want to find yourself saying something like, I didn't know I wasn't supposed to interview the students I teach before receiving IRB approval. Don't fail into any of these excuses. 
Here are some general tips. Start with understanding that you don't know what you don't know and that the unknown is greater than the known. Be a blank slate and soak up the literature. Secondly, find and follow the research literature trail and how it's changed over time, searching for what you need for understanding the topic, not for what you want for confirmation. You'll hear me say this again and again. Lastly, Try to synthesize the literature before you outline or write or form conclusions and beliefs. Culture bias is the result of assumptions based on our own and often ethnocentric cultural lens. It also leads to discriminative preferences for one or more culture over others. And this is all regardless of our awareness. If it's happening, we're likely not aware of it. Examples might include how researchers and participants view and treat each other, as well as how a research design might favor beliefs and behaviors of a particular culture. There are some tips for reducing culture bias. First, I recommend you start by writing down the assumptions and beliefs you are aware of. Reflect upon these as you go. Notice others and improve your awareness and behavior. As you review the literature, you should pay attention to the real and perceived cultural and other biases found in the literature. Take notes and learn from them. When necessary, within your own writing, you could also dedicate a section early in the lit review to what you've learned and the importance of acknowledging bias and how it can be changed when it is addressed. Additionally, you'll want to write with consideration and seek feedback. The APA 7 section on bias-free language is helpful. There are multiple respondent biases. Here are some. Acquiescence and courtesy biases lead to false results when participants agree out of politeness and often based on how the question or situation were set up. Demand characteristics result in participants behaving differently within the study. The participants change their behavior to match what they think is expected. Imagine participants code switching for the study. Extreme responding sets up a participant to strongly agree or strongly disagree in polar ways, rather than sharing their true beliefs in the middle. Be careful with how you set up Likert scales. Question order bias occurs when one question primes the answers for others and in a way that influences a participant to answer as they feel the researcher wants them to instead of honestly. As a tip, use easy early questions to help open up the participant to answer freely and honestly. Similar to the others, social desirability results in participants answering in ways that they think will improve how the researcher views them. Leading questions and wording bias, as you can imagine, are similar to question and order bias. These might not be biases on their own, but they connect with and influence bias. For example, how you summarize and elaborate what a participant says during an interview might alter the study because you could be indicating how you expect their future answers to align with your expectations, priming the following responses. The halo effect impacts both researchers and participants and generally revolves around one or more positive attributes. For example, the researcher and participant could find out that they both went to the same college. That would then change how they view and interact with each other. At this point in the presentation with all of these biases, it's expected to feel overwhelmed. And that's kind of the point. I want you to understand there are many biases at risk that are easily overlooked. Please learn to slow down, reflect, and then become more purposeful with your reading, research, and writing. Continuing on, information bias, also known as measurement bias, includes misclassification, recall, observer, and reporting biases. These biases typically result from errors in the measurement, classification, and or calculation of data. Data. Based on these errors, you might perceive and believe in something that wasn't even there. These errors might also be difficult for your committee and peers to notice if the data at issue is not reported. Non-response
response bias can occur even if your target population calculations and population are well designed. Simply put, those who do not participate in the study and those who do may have differences between them and your study will miss detecting that because of the non-participation. In other words, you might fail to capture and understand subpopulations and their views. Outliers. The extreme data of outliers can have a great impact on averages, particularly if you have a small sample. You'll want to decide how to report the findings, perhaps avoiding averages. Selection bias, which includes sampling bias, occurs when the data set does not align with research goals. For example, you might not get a large enough sample, or the sampling might not be randomized, leading to non-response bias and other risks. As you can imagine by now, there are many research biases to be aware of impacting both you, your participants, the data, and those who read your writing. Take your time to prepare and plan for potential problems. Finally, you'll also want to consider the bias in your writing. Here are some recommendations. Try to avoid making definitive statements in your own words. For example, use of words like must or need should be used sparingly when sharing your views. Use the words from the literature to highlight what established researchers have argued must be done. I also recommend structuring your writing with a variety of views, pros, cons, and synthesize the specific evidence in which ways that demonstrates your consideration of various perspectives. Additionally, you'll want to write it in a way that shows the reader relevant evidence and lets them form their own opinion, showing instead of telling. Lastly, connect and align your findings and recommendations to your literature review. For example, the sources you focus on in your literature review should also be used for your recommendation section. If your recommendation section has mostly different sources not used previously, it could give the impression that you sought out the sources to confirm your beliefs and to align with your own recommendations. Inclusivity is also important. Writing is a chance to showcase your understanding of the research, as well as your understanding of people and perspectives. Try to write in a way that is clear and specific for both an average educated person and an expert in the topic discussed. Awareness and sensitivity are valued. How you write demonstrates your understanding. Treat the topic and your consideration of others with care. To summarize the main points, your review of the literature should be for depth and breadth, and you should reach a saturation point before you start any writing. Search for sources that are fact-based, minimally biased, and from a variety of perspectives. Avoid relying on secondary sources. Your literature review should not be a revised version of other lit reviews. You shouldn't really even be citing at all from another researcher's lit review. If you see a researcher writing of something important, track down and read the original source they cited. Review the literature holistically and try to reach a saturation point where you understand how the research on a topic has evolved and branched out over time. Also, let the evidence as well as the recommendations for future research be your guide. To do this, you'll want to safeguard yourself from bias. Improve your awareness of biases before you develop your research design. Do not rush through the writing of your survey and or interview questions. Throughout the process, you want to check yourself for biases and seek feedback. You will have blind spots. Find others in the program that you trust for peer reviewing and help them also. The relationships you develop with classmates is one of the biggest benefits of your program. And do your best to show the reader everything you've learned and in a way that doesn't tell them what to think. Share the information with the reader and give them a chance to form their own opinions. As the writer, your role is to guide them through the information and your study. Please know this presentation is limited. My goal was to share information introducing you to many areas that I am not an expert in. I also have my own biases and blind spots. There are likely many things I failed to cover or focus on, and I probably botched 
some things too. Nonetheless, here are some key words for biases for you to look more into when you have a chance. First is a list of biases that I focused on. Next is a list I did not fully cover. These are still important though. For example, I hope you've learned some about cognitive bias. Perhaps write these down or take a picture of them. Lastly, I encourage you all to take time throughout the program to reflect on your biases in both life and academic research. These biases influence how you treat people as well as how others treat you. As a reminder, our individual and collective belief systems and heuristics shape our internalized and automated biases and habits. Positive changes to these for self and groups may require regular reflection, feedback, and purposeful adaptation. Please dedicate the time to and consideration needed to make the most of your doctoral research and time spent with others. And that's everything, folks. Please like, share, and contact me with questions about anything. Fight on.